I'm Evan Leeshout, and this is the University of Chicago Public Policy Podcast. Welcome to the University of Chicago Public Policy Podcasts. This is UC3P, our eponymously named podcast on policy, politics, and current affairs. My name is David Raban, and I'm the production manager for what we like to call the main page. Today, we begin our newest miniseries, Gun Violence, The Other Epidemic. In the next three episodes, we'll explore gun violence from the perspectives of policy advocacy, community organization, and public health research. In today's episode, we speak with Chris Brown, president of Brady. Brady is a nonprofit organization working to help end America's gun violence epidemic. We spoke to Ms. Brown about Brady's policy, what could be done on a federal level, and how to see gun violence as a voting issue. Before we get into the interview, a few notes. First, we recorded these episodes months ago, before the coronavirus. Second, we're going to be putting these episodes out quickly. Tune in this Friday and next Tuesday to hear the rest of the miniseries. Finally, instead of a blooper, we're going to end this episode with a preview of our next episode, so stay tuned for that. Now, let's get straight into the interview. Here's the president of Brady, Chris Brown. My name is Caroline Komzanski. My name is Sadant Wadera. And my name is Arjun Mota. We are student podcasters with UC3P, and this is The Other Epidemic, a mini-series on gun violence in the United States. Over these three episodes, we'll hear from three experts, each of whom brings a different perspective to the issue of gun violence. You will hear about policy advocacy, community organization, and public health research. This mini-series is not a comprehensive overview of the multifaceted and deeply complex issues surrounding gun violence. However, we hope these discussions provide some context of the work being done in this space. Our first interview was with Chris Brown, the president of Brady, formerly the Brady Campaign, a national organization advocating for policy changes to combat the gun violence epidemic. Previously, she worked for Representative Jim Moran of Virginia on the Brady Bill, a law that requires background checks on federally licensed gun sales. We spoke with Brown at the University of Chicago Symposium on Gun Violence. The video of her talk is linked in the show notes. She holds a law degree from George Mason University School of Law and received her B.A. from Virginia Tech. Brown spoke with us about the history of Brady and the work it is currently doing to combat gun violence. We discussed alternative policy proposals and the ways in which Brady is collaborating with local organizations and communities. Welcome to UC3P. Today we have Chris Brown, the president of Brady. Brady is a national organization dedicated to combating gun violence in the United States. Chris, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. So my first question for you is, can you please talk about Brady's efforts to expand background checks at the state and federal level? Yes, thank you for that question. I'm more than happy to talk about that. Obviously, Brady bears the name of Jim and Sarah Brady, who are responsible, not single-handedly, there was a large movement behind them, but for the passage, the enactment of the federal background check system that we have in place today. Of course, that law passed more than a quarter century ago. And at the time that it passed, there was not this thing they call the internet, and gun shows weren't big business, but today they are. And as a result, about one in five guns sold today is sold with no background check at all. So what we're trying to do at the state and federal level is really expand the Brady Law to cover those kinds of sales and to ensure that before any gun is sold in any state across the country, that a background check is done. Since the Brady Law was put into effect, we've stopped more than 3.5 million, million sales of guns to prohibited purchasers. It's our best defense in ensuring that dangerous people don't have easy access to guns and we need to expand it. 
I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the cultural image of guns, masculinity or symbolic value in preceding American history with uh, frontier individualism or ruggedness or something like that and the kind of work that Brady is doing to overcome that. It's a really good question. I think that if you look at some of the, the litigation that has been brought, one of the issues that we're very focused on when we look at the marketing behind many of the guns that you see in circulation today, the kind of marketing that goes with it is this idea of guns as representational of masculinity. I think one of the Remington ads that was notable in the Sandy Hook case actually has a picture of a gun and it's a, an assault style weapon and it says, get your man card here, as if that kind of weapon is synonymous with anything of virtue that you would associate with manhood. And of course, that kind of marketing is dangerous and toxic and ultimately goes against the heritage of gun ownership in this country, quite frankly. Because even in towns that they would call the Wild West, right, that existed, a little known fact is in most of those towns, gun ownership, gun owners were required to check their guns at the town borders not bring them into saloons. There's not any linkage in our history with being a good person and having a gun or masculinity and gun, but there is this marketing effort that the NRA has funded over the last 20 years to attempt to tie the two. And really part of our job is combating that, combating that with facts and information. And so are there any kind of counter-marketing techniques or advertising things that our listeners might be able to look up that Brady is doing right now? One of the things Brady has been very focused on is the the issue of guns in the home. We have over 380 million guns in this country, more guns than people. Eight kids a day are killed or injured with guns in their own home. And so when we looked at that, we tried to figure out what we can do to talk about the solutions to ensure that individuals who bring guns into the home engage in safe storage. So one of the campaigns that folks can find information about on our site that we launched is a campaign to end family fire. Family fire is a term we have coined, and that is the unintentional injury or death of kids with guns from their own home. I think these kinds of campaigns are really important to frame the issue as one of responsibility. It's not vilifying someone for choosing to have a gun in the home, but what it's saying is if you're going to do that, you need to ensure that it's safely stored or it's much more likely that that gun is going to be used to harm you, your child, or someone visiting your home. It happens every day. So I want to switch a little bit and talk about some of the policy ideas outside of expanding background checks that have been thrown out there. After a mass shooting in 1996, Australia instituted a gun buyback program. What is Brady's position on a program like this? And why is that the position? Brady has supported gun buybacks in the past. We don't have any major gun buybacks that we're supporting at the moment, but we do have over 100 chapters across the country. And sometimes our chapters will support gun buyback efforts that are done at the local level. Brady is a very data-driven organization, so at least from the United States perspective, there's sort of mixed results on gun buybacks. I think that when combined with other policies, they can be very successful, but they alone, given the number of guns that we have in the country, are probably not the prime solution. There are many other policies that Brady is advocating that we think are equally, if not more, important. And so while Beto O'Rourke famously said, hell yes, we're going to buy back your assault weapons, some other candidates proposed these gun registry plans that they would implement if they got elected. And so what are your and Brady's thoughts on this gun registry as a tool of uh, reducing gun violence? I think in combination with other requirements, that can be very powerful. I mean, I think what's happened in the presidential race, Beto's comments aside, is that you see the candidates really competing against one another to come up with comprehensive solutions to the gun violence epidemic. And first of all, I'd like to say that having the candidates frame this issue as an epidemic itself is very important because there are public health approaches. Think about automobiles, and you guys are too young to remember this, but I remember driving around in my father's Buick with no seatbelts, all of the things. There were certainly no airbags. And when traffic fatalities were really increasing in the 1950s, it's not like Congress or the state legislators said, what is the one thing that will save a few lives? What they said was, what are all of the things that we can do 
to design automobiles and roads differently to save the most human lives. There's absolutely no reason that we should not be exploring all of the different options that we know can meaningfully save lives around this issue. And I think registration is a component of that. I think expanding the Brady Law is another important piece. I think robust permitting systems before individuals are given guns are very important and training around that. And I think expanding extreme risk laws are key components, as well as regulating assault style weapons and high capacity magazines. So are there any executive actions that a Democratic president or a governor could take to reduce gun violence? Yes. And in fact, thank you for that question. We know President Obama took a number of executive actions, albeit later in his presidency than we as an organization necessarily would have liked. Some of those executive actions within 90 days of President Trump taking office were reversed. Just one example of that was that the Social Security Administration had spent years putting a rule together that would have added individuals who were deemed mentally incompetent Congress's words, not mine, under the Social Security regulations, would have been put into the background check system. President Trump reversed that. There are a variety of other actions administrative agencies can take to meaningfully increase the effectiveness of the background check system that the president can require through executive action. There's a key area that we're very focused on for executive action. We have a whole list on our website of things that we want the president to do. But the ATF is the federal agency charged with administration of all of the inspections of gun dealers across this country. It has for far too long been captive to the gun industry and literally led by the gun industry. And it also, conversely, does not have enough resourcing. So this election is so important because the president can put an actual law enforcement focused individual in charge of the ATF. They can finally crack down on the 5% of gun dealers fueling 90% of crime guns, including places like Chicago. And that will have a meaningful impact on reducing, in particularly, urban gun violence. So there's a variety of things that can be done. We get a majority in the Senate, a gun violence prevention majority, not Republicans or Democrats, but we probably need 60 because of the filibuster, which means the importance of executive action is all the more heightened. Hey, thanks for listening to UC3P, the main page. We know you're enjoying this episode and we really want to get you back to it as soon as possible. The problem is, if you're listening to this, there's a really good chance you haven't subscribed to the show yet. Don't worry, that's super easy to fix. Just go on your phone, pick your favorite podcast app, and type in UC3P or the main page. It's easy to subscribe, and we know you don't want to miss any more episodes. Again, type in UC3P or the main page and subscribe. Now go tell a friend. The generations that are most impacted by gun violence are millennials and Gen Z. But we also know that in order to get that gun violence prevention majority in the legislature, we need these generations to come out and vote. So can gun violence act as a salient enough issue? Or are there any people on the ground trying to use gun violence as a method of getting these generations out to vote? Yes, I think that it can and has acted as a very salient issue. I'm a Virginian. We had an election in 2017. We've had one more recently than that. But I'll harken back to the 2017 election because we had a candidate who was not favored to win, who did run on a very strong gun violence prevention platform. And a huge record number of 18 to 34 year olds showed up in that election and voted. The number two issue at the polls, according to exit polls, was the issue of gun violence. The same thing happened in the last election in Virginia, where there's a historic shift of an election of a gun violence prevention majority in the House and Senate. And in 2018, in the House of Representatives, you had about 40 plus seats shift from NRA A plus rated candidates to Brady backed candidates. And that wasn't happenstance. That was, again, the 18 to 34 year old demographic over representing itself at the polls. One thing I would say, though, is that gun violence knows no age bounds. Individuals of all walks of life are impacted by it. I think in particular, Folks who've been subject day in and day out 
to uh, educational experience where lockdown drills were 